you can hear me. <laughs> yes, we I'm can. excited to introduce Pino, whom I've known for many years. Okay. And she has, um, she's a birder gone bad, as she says, or she's gone to the dark side. And that means that she's gotten really interested in moths in the last few years and has become an expert in moths from different parts of the world. And it's been, so tonight you'll be treated to a new outlook on moths. If you've thought of them as being kind of pesky insects that fly around street lights at night or eat your clothes, that's not what they are. They are incredible insects. And Pam has, uh, who's been involved in Boulder Audubon for many years and um, has traveled, lived in Norway and Egypt in, um, when, when she and Joe were there on, uh, for, for business and done all kinds of work there. Uh, with all kinds of uh, animals. Um, and so it's, it, and she's been very involved. If you know her, you know, you've probably been on one of her field trips to look at, at butterflies or been to her garden, her Zurich garden. She's a very avid gardener and um, has done all kinds of surveys up in space for um, butterflies and birds and other creatures. So tonight, we're lucky to have Pam share her wonderful photos of moths. You will be blown away if you have not seen these before. They are so beautiful and the importance of moths in our ecosystems cannot be overemphasized as Pam will tell you. So enjoy this program that Pam is going to present to you, this special program. Perfect. Thank you, Carol, for the lovely introduction. And now I need to minimize the screen and figure out where my PowerPoint program is. Okay. I'm going to start this evening briefly <laughs> uh, recommending a book that will be published uh, sometime this year, we hope. Um, it was, it's being done by Lynn and Jean Monroe. They're incredible citizen scientists and really experts. Uh, they first came to my attention when I was visiting uh, Anza Borrego State Park in California. And I saw their first book, which was about uh, desert insects and kin of Southern California. I was impressed by the scope, the quality of the photos and the research therein. I later learned that lo and behold, Lynn and Jean are local residents and have been working for many years on this publication. I have been delighted and privileged to be able to share a lot of my photos with them, many of which I've taken in my native and Zurich gardens. Lynn and Jean's book will be amazing. It's over 1,200 pages. It's quite a tome. It covers over 1,200 insects and over 2,000 photos. Do look for it. And if you want to learn and enjoy what is in the Colorado Front Range, please buy this. Moving on to a celebration of moss. Why moss? When I started truly looking in, at and for them, I realized how absolutely special they can be and how I, an untrained citizen science wannabe, might help to fill in a few gaps uh, for the, lep the real lepidopterists working in research. Okay, I, I want you quick to look at this sample page because it's an indication of the amazing work that Lynn and Jean do. Okay, moving right along now. Water moss, they're lepidoptera. They are one of the three biggest families or orders of animals on the earth. 
The other ones would be the coleoptera or beetles or diptera or flies. Might be even more flies than coleoptera because they're not that well studied. They're insects that are covered with scales. So Lepidoptera is from the Greek, scale, wings. The scales are made of chitin and overlap, providing all kinds of advantages to these night flying insects. So most of us are very, very familiar with the day flying butterflies. And I've listed here a list of the differences and the mostly you can tell immediately if it were, which to whom it belongs by looking at their antennae. And generally there's, as I put on top, there's always exceptions, but the butterflies are, are generally day flyers. The moths are generally night flyers. The moths are heavier. They are generally fuzzier. And uh, one of the really big differences is the uh, absence or presence of a frenulum, which is a way that the uh, moths can hook their wings together to make a uh, better airfoil uh, because they need to fly stronger flight because of their weight and especially the females with uh, carrying eggs or the male while they're mating. The moss scales are really jump out at you when you look at them. Uh, of course, they're responsible for color and pattern. They detach to get out of spider's webs. I'm sure a lot of you have seen spiders building webs as the evening rolls on. And um, they, uh, are a big predator in the evening. The water repellency is amazing. Uh, we were in Malaysia in December of 19, and it was pouring buckets. And the moss kept coming to the lights and coming to the lights and coming to the lights. And they really looked like water off the duck's back the way it was beating up and they weren't phased at all. Um, of course, bats are a major predator and their fuzzier scales absorb a lot of their clicks and help them evade them. Um, I put the little illustration on the right because, um, let me see, I have a pointer here. You'll see the heaviest scaling generally on the thorax and that needs to stay warmer in the evenings because the moss cannot rely on the sun uh, to generate heat the way the butterflies do. And so they uh, shiver and it's a chemical reaction to get energy to those flight mesh, uh, muscles. And often I have a stunning moth that I have a terrible time trying to take a picture of because they won't stop moving for a second. They can be amazingly colorful. Uh, people just think of moss as dull brown cloth eating nuisances. Let's go through some of these um, from both uh, Western states and Thailand. This was photographed up at uh, Calwood, where I add to their databases. This beauty, Malaysia. You can see how wet the ground is. Another one, Thailand. Right here in Boulder at my house. Those feathery antennae, which are distinctive for moss. This one, I love the blue eyes. I mean, how could you resist that one? And the apanthesis are, um, I have quite a few species here in Colorado and one is prettier than the other. They can be incredible mimics. This picture was taken by John Barr. It is not a wasp. This is one of the clear wing moss. And um, I'm so jealous I didn't see this, but good for John. So 
So if that flashed at me, this is a big moth. It's probably a good five inches. And if that flashed those eyes at me in the, in the uh, forest, I think I'd run. This represents two flies eating bird uh, droppings. How about a couple lizards protecting each wing? I have not seen this yet. It is in Thailand. I couldn't resist showing it because it's so very special. They can be cryptic. Put this in a uh, forested tree and uh, try and find it. I love these leaf mimics and especially how the labial palps look like a dead leaf stem. These you'll find up amongst the aspen. This is the caterpillar of this Synclora errata. It takes petals from the flowers on which it is grazing and glues them to its back. And they really are difficult to see. Uh, I have one that's all purple uh, because it was on Agostaki. Uh, many of you have seen the Shinia volupia. I want you to note how it aligns its yellow head with the yellow petal and the orange with the orange in the flower. Just, just brilliant adaptations. This one you're gonna find amongst ponderosa pine. Um, this is rather wordy, but the gist of this is there's a lot of Lepidoptera, but there's a lot more moss than there are uh, butterflies. And the ratio at this point now is about 12 to one, but as research um, is done and species are added, they expect it to go 15 or 20 to one um, moss to butterflies. And this is incredibly important for who is feeding the bird populations. It can be absolutely sublime. Another Thai one. This was taken in a men's room in, in a national park in Thailand uh, with Joe standing guard <laughs> as I stood there trying to uh, reach this one way up on the ceiling and hoping no men would come by to use the facilities. This is, these are actually uh, clear panels. This one's from Moab. This is a rather rare emerald taken up in Eldora along Middle Boulder Creek. Uh, emeralds are, we have quite a few, they're absolutely gorgeous moss. Shimmery, gorgeous colors, another one from Malaysia. One of my absolutely favorite um, genuses, or genera, is uh, the Zamoratas. And they can be pink or blue or yellow, um, very difficult to tell apart. And uh, just love when we do find them, which isn't that often. Some really big ones. These are the Saturnidae. And we do have one here in Colorado. I have not been lucky enough to find it one of these days. So this one to six inches, another beautiful Malaysian Saturnidae. These is Lisa Sampa, and they're known to have huge eruptions about every 10 years where their larva tree will be stripped to the nubbins and tens of thousands can show up at lights uh, in the uh, villages. This is our biggest Arribidae in the, in the uh, US and probably the one people want to see the most called the Black Witch. Um, this photo I took in Hawaii and it was up under an eave. So it's rather weird angle, but I think you can see that it has some glorious colors too. It can be really, really strange. 
I love how raptorial this one is, even with the beak. I've probably photographed half a dozen of this uh, cicadas, uh, not very well known or studied, but very, very different. I don't know what to say about this one. It's hard to see that this is the head here. Great big eye. Looks like it's eared. And I, I've never seen a moth before with the antennae with a strip of coloration down the side. This is probably the strangest, which took me two years to identify. Um, it's very, very rare in Thailand. And uh, I like to call it the caped wonder. These are really, really interesting um, moths who are um, specialists in raiding beehives. They have all kinds of adaptation. They emit a pheromone that mimics the bees. And of course, the bees rely on uh, odor to uh, know who belongs there or not. They make a squeak like the queen bee. They uh, have clawed feet that they could uh, wander around within the hive fairly easily, and a very strong and stiff pointed um, proboscis where they uh, can easily pierce the honeycombs. Um, they also have uh, a very thick um, scaling and are somewhat immune to bee stings, but they are sometimes found dead, so the bees do win now and then. Okay, this is a real, real simple food chain. Um, it's leaving out what's going on under the ground and all of the uh, recyclers, but the gist here, which is incredibly important to this discussion is that, of course, plants grow from the energy of the sun and insects are primary consumers of plants. They are, if this was a triangle, they are right there, uh, the next step up from the base. And when you think about how many eagles there might be in the world uh, compared to how many insects, it's a huge difference and they're critically important to the success of all other animals, including us. Lepidopterus speed. This is a robber fly right here. Uh, I left, I'm sorry. Um, dragonflies. Lizards. Wasps. Spiders. frogs, toads, rodents, and especially bats. Um, the frog, we have a wonderful toad population in my gardens and these little buggers often get to a moth before I do. Um, and I've actually picked them up and moved them and they're back within 30 seconds. So it's, it's rather humorous, but sometimes frustrating. Uh, the mice will come out at night and eat the moss as well. And of course, this bat is smiling, thinking about its next moth meal. And even our grizzly bears. In the late eight, uh, 1980s, a helicopter pilot was flying over rocky or talus slopes in Yellowstone, and he saw a bunch of grizzlies uh, on these steep slopes. Uh, scientists went in to see what are they doing there? You know, why, why would they be where there's no obvious food? Well, it turns out that the Miller moths that drive us absolutely crazy in the uh, late spring and early summer uh, have migrated sometimes up to 300 miles from Eastern Colorado, uh, Nebraska, Kansas. And during the night, they uh, nectar on all of the alpine flowers. And during the day, they hide and sleep under the rocks on these slopes. Well, the bears have found these and spend days up there flipping rocks 
and they estimate that each uh, moth is between a half a calorie and a calorie. And it's estimated that the bears will eat 40,000 moths a day. So a tremendously important source of winter fat uh, for the bear population. This I'm gonna go on for a while about. Um, the importance of Lepidoptera to our bird populations. These photos are by Dave Leatherman, who of course uh, writes for um, the Colorado Birds magazine. Um, his column is What Birds Eat. He's a retired entomologist. Most everyone associates National Audubon Society with birds. It's the reason uh, we were established and why this organization remains focused on them to a great extent. Birds cannot survive without the plants and insects with which they co-evolved. This is a really important concept. They cannot raise their nestlings without the protein provided by insects. Uh, to address this, Connie Holsinger uh, established the Habitat Hero Program to encourage uh, gardeners to live this um, concept and be stewards of co uh, complex regional ecosystems. I did not understand this basic concept, nor really hadn't thought about it till late in life when native gardener extraordinaire and dear friend, Jean Morgan dope slapped me and explain why I should not plant non-native plants in my gardens if I wanted to support insects and birds. A high percentage of our native insects, including the bees, only forage on specific plants. With various body parts, they taste the chemical composition of the beautiful flowering plants bought at local nurseries from other parts of the world shudder and move on. They're utterly useless for adults or their larvae as they simply cannot metabolize these different chemicals. If the insects don't thrive, the birds won't either. Dr. Um, Doug Talamy, and at the end of this program, I've listed a couple of YouTube presentations he does, which are brilliant. He's probably the most succinct succinct, thoughtful, and well-documented proponent of the importance of native plants to native insects, to native birds, and so on up the food chain. You'll remember that there are 10 to 15 times more moth species as butterfly species. They all start out as caterpillars. Dr. Talamy and his students have documented by camera traps pointed at bird's nests that for one instance, Carolina chickadees to raise a brood of four young brought and stuffed down their gullets between six and 9,000 insects. That's one brood. The staggering count was uh, tallied before the young fledged and the cameras could no longer track uh, how the birds, how much the birds continue to feed. In the Northeast, many, if not most, of this baby food um, is the caterpillars, which Dr. Talamy likens to soft sausages. There are also nutritional reasons for a preference for Lepidoptera. They're high in protein, fats, and especially carotenoids um, than any other insect family. Carotenoids are well known as an essential and critical part of any vertebrates diet, diet including ours. In discussions with uh, Dave Leatherman, he suggests that without extensive deciduous forests like you find in the Northeast, um, the caterpillars might not be quite as important here as they are. And instead, birds might rely more on uh, other abundant, the most other abundant insects, which would be uh, from the Orthoptera family, which is grasshoppers, crickets, katydid, locusts, et cetera. Nonetheless, uh, lepidopters still play a very important role in bird uh, life.
here's a uh, probably a moth most of you are familiar with uh, because it's so big and it's a day flyer, Hylis lineata, called Sphinx moth, Hawk moth. Um, and they are a really good size, strong flyer and have a great big long tongue. They love to pollinate these tubular flowers. Um, incredibly, research on moths as pollinators is relatively recent, but uh, in well-structured studies, they are pretty astounded about what they're, uh, they're finding. Uh, their hairy bodies uh, move great amounts of pollen very efficiently. They often visit a much broader array, array of um, plants than um, uh, bees do. They're especially strong, uh, drawn to stronger odors uh, of night blooming plants. It is speculated that uh, I'm sure some of you gardeners have noticed that as the day goes on, um, some uh, flowers will uh, start to lose their uh, colors and become a lot more pale. Um, it is speculated that that is perhaps to attract moths to finish the job of pollinating that the daytime uh, uh, bees and other insects didn't get done uh, during the day. They're easier to see at night. There are some plants that are only moth pollinated, which include our native yuccas. There's a very symbiotic relationship between the yucca moth and the yuccas. Witch hazel is only moth and some tropical fruits. Undoubtedly more will be found as more research is done. Um, of course, complete metamorphosis, egg, caterpillar, larva, and adult. I always love this cartoon. Um, the females and a lot of species, if not most, initiate mating by releasing this infinitesimally small amount of pheromone, sometimes as little as a billionth of a gram. The moth antennae are so sensitive, the males will pick up on it, sometimes from quite a distance. They fly in a zigzag pattern, um, as they lose and then regain the scent to zero in on the moth. Uh, Rudolf Mel in 1922 did an interesting experiment. At his home, he caged um, some virgin female Actius moths. I'll show you one later. Uh, it's a uh, Southeast Asian species. Then he caged them in gauze. So they were emitting the pheromones. He hopped on a train and released tag males at intervals. They returned from as far, as far away as seven and a half miles. Males also could emit pheromones uh, that usually used for different reasons. They um, seem to serve as aphrodisiacs and tranquilizers when the male moths uh, do find the females. Now, these down here um, are called coromata, and uh, that is the, where the scent emits from in the male. Now, I'm going to show you a Southeast Asian species with the most amazing coromata out there, and this next one actually initiates uh, breeding. So here we have when the uh, coronata are not extended, and um, that is just the weirdest looking creature. It, um, the size of the coromata depends on the amount of alkaloids, alkaloids it has ingested uh, in its larval form. And in mating, they are able to pass some of these alkaloids onto the female and her eggs for better protection and success. Of course, um, lots of things eat Lepidoptera. Lots and lots of things eat Lepidoptera, as I, sh I showed before. Um, hairy, hairy caterpillars. A lot of birds, a lot of times they're spiked with some poisons um, or just 
irritating as can be. They can detach very easily and irritate the throats of birds. This little twig, of course, is a caterpillar. And here we have one that can uh, thrash his head like it's a snake. If you ever come upon a um, nest of the um, tent caterpillars, Malacosomas, you can see them as you approach start to thrash in unison. So another way that they try and defend. Um, they can uh, show fake eyes, vomit bright colors, or pretend to be dead and drop to the ground. Uh, caterpillars go through a series of molts. They're called instars. Many of the earliest instars will look like bird droppings, very unappetizing. And then uh, many of them, after going from bird droppings, they start to take on aposematic or warning colors. Um, this is the Actius I mentioned before, uh, absolutely stunning moth, probably seven or eight inches from nose to the end of the tail. But these long and curved tails are incredibly effective at um, evading moth attacks. The moths just can't make their sonar work. Uh, it's just confused by the, uh, these, these uh, twisted tails and they often escape because this is an awful big target and would make one big meal. Uh, this is, uh, was uh, photographed up at Nina and Davis's. A lot of you have been out with Davis on bird trips and uh, some of the original work on, this is Aribidi, the subfamily is Arctini and uh, they, as they do research, these moths not only emit clicks to tell bats, I'm not palatable, they also can jam the sonar. So uh, just in the last probably 10 years, a lot of very neat research being done on the evasive mechanisms of moths. Another way that they beat uh, the uh, uh, or have great defenses against predators, is this is all the same species. A lot of color variation. So birds will form a picture of what they want to look for and say, okay, I know this color is yummy. I'm going to, you know, pick this. And then they run out of these and maybe They'll move, oh, I've tried this one. I guess this one's pretty good too. Not too sure about these. And there seems to be some color shifting over time where if birds take out every last one of these moths, the next generation can be a diff different color. So again, some really interesting research on, on um, how they're surviving. This was taken up on um, Douglas Pass and between, uh, very aposematically colored uh, moth. Uh, about a dozen came to the light. It was very exciting. Um, and so a combination of eye spots and the coloring, I'm not good to eat. How about a couple of big owl eyes? And almost all of the big uh, Saturnidae in the tropics will have snake heads on the edge of their wings. You see that over and over. And um, I keep finding really tattered ones. This was the best picture, but the fresher ones, it's amazingly, amazingly snake-like. Okay, moths have a bad rap. Some of them are a real pain. There's, there's no two ways about it. These are the wonderful clothes moths. Pretty, a pretty little thing, but oh my God, once you have them, you probably, you won't die of them, but you'll die with them. You know, the the uh, moss that get in all the meals and cereals. Of course, uh, the malacosomas, 
that are the tent caterpillars. It's a gorgeous moth though. They're really, really pretty. If they do strip a shrub, generally the shrub has enough energy to go back. So don't go too crazy. Um, these are some of the moths that'll do a lot of damage to the conifers in Colorado. And here's your Miller moth. Now I think that's a handsome moth. They're highly variable, um, but these are the ones that want to get into your house by the tens or thousands every spring and uh, early summer. They're feeding the bears, they're feeding the bears. Tell yourself they're feeding the bears. These are really pretty. Uh, another uh, one from uh, specializes on ponderosa pine cones. Okay, you've all bitten into an apple and found a worm. Here's, here's your villain. Why do the moss come to light? Um, a lot of theories have been positive, posited. Uh, no one's quite figured it out, although there are some pretty good thoughts. Uh, part of it is for hundreds of millions of years, moths, there was no artificial light. It's only the last 200 years. And it started with um, dim old candles in the early 1700s, moved to gas lamps. And it really wasn't until the uh, 20s and 30s as cars became popular that streets were electrified. Um, they are uh, mostly uh, in dark areas oriented to the moon, the stars, and they don't, um, they, they use, and they also have electromagnetic, just like birds, uh, positioning system. So they orient themselves uh, to up and down. And um, some of the reasons I think they might go toward light is because it indicates a path through a force so they don't bump into anything. Um, the, once they get to the lights, a lot of times the moss settle down and don't move for hours. And that's probably because they think they've hit the sun and are gone to sleep for the day. That's when I get my best, my best pictures. So here's the equipment I use. It's uh, pretty simple. My dear husband, Joe, um, built me this ballasted mercury vapor, mercury vapor bucket lamp. I take a bunch of uh, magnets and put up a clean sheet and pray it doesn't blow too hard. This is up in um, Owl Ridge in North Park, which is just a wonderful area. This was uh, in Fraser's Hill and I wanted to show this is Malaysia and um, all the rips in this are from owls coming in to pick off the moss. So there was two or three uh, owls of two different species who went, oh, wow, this is an easy meal. So here's uh, down at the bottom right, the uh, light system is under an umbrella because like I said, it never stopped raining. And if you can see down here, this is all mud, which I totally churned up their lawn. I also had my first leech bite, which was um, weird, but not as bad as I thought, thought it would be. We get some other really interesting species coming in. Uh, the hognas are always a treat. They're big. Uh, up at uh, Nina and Davis's, they, one night we probably had a dozen. Uh, lots of tapulidae, which are the crane flies. And uh, we have a lot of different species. Uh, I see a lot of variation in these. Um, this is one of the burying beetles. If something dies, it buries, it digs underneath it and keeps digging and digging and digging and sort of uh, burying it from the top down or from the underneath down, I should say. And these, when I first saw these, I was like, oh my God, it's so infested with a parasitic mite. No, those mites are only hitchhiking to the next dead animal. 
Uh, I love these uh, Ichneumonidae, which are the um, parasitic uh, wasps. And they are a night flyer, and I see them very, very often. And this rather strange uh, mantispidae, so it's sort of a cross between a praying mantis and a snake fly. And um, I've actually photographed three different species in uh, the front range. Uh, this is taken from bugguide.net, which is a great resource if you're trying to uh, get some help to figure out what you've seen. It didn't uh, reproduce very well, it's rather fuzzy, but there are so many species of moss and so many different families and subfamilies and genera um, that this is a great way to just look at the shape and say, okay, maybe it belongs in this group, I should start looking here. So I wanted to show that. And so I'm going to go through now some of the, um, the most, I think, five most common families we see here. So the tertricity, um, usually with the wings folded over the back and from really pretty to really bland, um, also known as leaf rollers. So you see rolled leaves. Often you can find one of these pupating inside. Um, they can be really, really colorful or the patterns just glorious. Another real pretty pelicrista. Uh, Crambidae are not near as common as in Thailand, but we have some of them here. So uh, generally a big long snout, which is their um, palps, or they can be uh, in a bell shape. Uh, kind of uh, shape when you're looking at them. So there's that snout and a half, or this bell shaped. This one's from Thailand. Geometry or geometers. Uh, you, you know the caterpillars as inchworm, the way they move up their bodies to move forward. Uh, usually quite a spread ring posture. They're some of the easiest to immediately put in a family and then identify. So this was up in Netherlands as well. This is a real typical posture. This one's a pretty good size one. This one is in Jackson County. And most of you are very familiar with the sphingidae or the hornworms or hawk moths. Um, caterpillars always are gonna have a thorn on the rear end. So you can tell that, hey, I've got a hawk moth there. There's 34 species. So, so much more than just that one um, pink one that's so common. So these, and this um, down here, I consider this about an average size moth. This is one of the Noctuni. And so you can see the size difference. Uh, they're big moths, strong flyers. I read that the um, people are using the flight patterns of some of these sphingidae to program drones because they're so efficient at weaving through obstacles. Beautiful peonius. Sphinx Vashti. This is an introduction to try and um, control euphorbia. We'll see how that works out. This came to my light at my house. The Rebidae, um, a lot of work is being done on the phylogenetic order of moss and a lot have been lumped recently into Rebidae. Um, the black witch that I showed you earlier is one. They can range from tiny to quite large. It's a big family. Um, they're generally sort of triangle shaped without a a bell bulge, I should say. So let me go down and show you some. Of course, um, 
there's your woolly bear. Everybody knows woolly bears. Well, here's what uh, the moth that it turns into. It actually has a pink uh, or red uh, abdomen. Uh, the catacolas are a decent sized family here. They're all under wings and they would flash that red pattern to uh, uh, try to uh, distract a bird and get away. Uh, this one I just think is the most, one of the most charming ones I find in uh, Thailand. I love the little clown face. Uh, I found these in my yard and up high. So it's got quite the range in Colorado. Another really pretty one. So the Noctuity, army cutworms, most have a lot of long scaling on their heads, can be very destructive. Fish and pollinators again. They are incredibly difficult to sort and identify. And I work, uh, I post a lot on iNaturalists, which I love. A lot of experts just say, oh God, another Noctuidae, Noctuidae, uh, and just leave it at uh, genus. They can be really pretty though, too. This, uh, the Cinepolia is quite common. I've only seen this once uh, down south. And this one's quite common too. Joe calls this the rock star moth. So these are the flower moths and also the uh, Shinia Belupia I showed you before on the uh, flower is the same family. In the summers, uh, every year there's a National Moth Week, the third week in July. I generally invite people to lights. Um, I will do it again this year. We'll see how big a crowd we can accommodate or not. But uh, if you're fascinated and think you'd like to learn more, I would love to have you join me. In summary, why do we love and appreciate moss? Here's some resources. This is gonna be put up on YouTube. So if you'd like to look through this again, or uh, refer to any of these books, or the Ptolemy programs on YouTube, which again are brilliant. And this is a list of the slides that were on the opening slide. Uh, I mean, the um, um, loss that were the opening slide, if you're curious. And here's my thank you to so many who have helped me. And uh, my husband's an absolute angel, a patient, indulgent, uh, runs the generator for the light, uh, fixes my computer, my everything. It's, I couldn't do this without him. Thank you, baby. Uh, there's some questions. Thank you, Pam. Um, while other folks are starting to maybe compose their questions on chat, um, Elena Claver asked if the Hogan spider that you showed earlier is a wolf spider. Uh, yeah, they're they're also known as wolf spiders. Okay. Anybody else with with questions for Pam? I guess not. So yeah. I, you know, I lived not too far from where you spent a bunch of time for a while as well. Um, is our Thailand and, and Malaysia particularly great places to see an abundance of species of, of moths? A absolutely. Okay. Uh, and a lot of, I think I helped the most there with distribution. Uh, I work, um, I have a mentor in Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Roger Kendrick, and he can identify most of what I find 
but often um, he'll say, oh, another new one for Thailand, another new one for Thailand, great, great, you know, keep sending the stuff in. So, um, but we've been going to Thailand for almost, uh, I don't know, 17, 18 years now. And it's frightening to see the deforestation and switching over to rubber tree plantations. And they, even the steepest slopes, they cut down. So the mushroom crop is better they can sell. It's, it's, it's really, really um, hard to see. But there's still places, Joe and I always rent a car and pretty much tour the national parks. And, um, I bring a different light set up over there that either I plug in and try to get a cabin on the outskirts of some uh, some good looking habitat or oh, okay. like a car battery. But but the malls over there are a lot more colorful and, and truly amazing as are the butterflies. If there's no other questions, oh, thank you. we've got a we've got a few people are oh, okay. They just needed to get a moment to start, okay. Start uh, typing. Um, maybe while we're doing that, you could go back to the slide at the beginning of your presentation that had information on the book that you recommended. Um, and while you're doing that, um, and tying back to the native plants, uh, um, what I do? Are there any particular native plants that are sort of must-haves if you're interested in supporting moths in Boulder County? Oh dear. Um, the Enotheras, the evening primroses, are a huge magnet. Um, the Jupiter's beard are very, I often see moths on. Um, I see moths a lot on um, the Augusta Keys. I, I don't know a lot of common names, so I'm sorry that, uh, I guess that's called double bubble mint or something like that. Um, they, um, because I'm running the light, most of them come and sit on the sheet and that's why so many of the photos are against a white sheet. Uh -huh. But, um, just native plants. And because I'm so focused on the light and the she, I'm peripherally seeing moss on plants, but not paying all that much attention to them. Um, the research that was done, they actually counted, they would capture moss after a night um, foraging and they would scrape off all the pollen from their fur and um, sort the pollen grains into where it came from. And the moths were visiting a lot of different plants. So I think most of the natives you put out there, they, they like, um, these aren't native to this area, but I still grow them for several reasons. Um, the great big daturas, datura metalloides, the great big white, what do they call moonflowers? They're, they're a great moth plant. Um, there's, um, I'm having a senior moment with some of these names. I think I probably be part of a garden tour again this year. So people uh, could come and see what's in my yard. And um, in Lynn and Jean's book, when you buy it, um, many, many photos I took were right from the gardens and they're not that big. We're two acres, but I don't think it's more than several hundred square feet that um, I maintain. I'm trying to figure out how to get back. There we go, okay. So you wanna go back to Lynn and Jean's book. Yeah, you can just, there you and go. Is this available and has it been published now or is it still coming? No, and I asked um, Lynn and Jean uh, when they thought it might uh, be out and she wasn't quite sure. It, um, she's in the very last part of doing the final edit and then they have to put, put a publisher and they weren't sure if they would send it overseas or have it done in the US. Um, so she couldn't give me a date, 
but um, it, it, they really do outstanding, outstanding work. So okay. there's- So we might have to be patient. Pardon? We might but, have to be patient before we can find yeah, out. Yeah, I think you're, it's, I think it's gonna be a few months anyway. If so, not, um, Couple more questions. Here's a question from I think Hazel Gordon, who visited a muse a local museum in back in 2019. They had an amazing gallery of huge moth photographs, but she's lost track of what museum it might have been. And she wonders whether or not you know off the top of your head. No. That I, might be. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, no. Okay. All right. Um I'm, I'm hard of hearing. I, I'm I'm struggling. <laughs> okay. Scott Sievers is asking how he can build a bug lamp. Oh, Scott, talk to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, they have to be ballasted for the um, real strong mercury vapor. So um, Joe uh, had some help from Paul Oppler from uh, uh, there's resources online now. Um, Van Truen, who is the other person who does a lot of moth um, photography as an amateur um, from down the Puebla area, um, he his son made him uh, a setup with um, uh, what are the new high efficiency bulbs? Someone little LED. Little, thank you, LED bulbs. So um, I want to look at what he's done for Thailand because he can run it off a battery, which is so much nicer than dealing with a car battery or plugging in or running the noisy generator. Okay. Um, you know, with birds, we're used to seasonal variation and migration, and you know, some birds are here during some parts of the year and, and other years not. Can you? Give us a little bit of insight into how the annual life cycle of moths unfolds and when we're most likely to see moths in their adult stage. Well, there, there's um, some that are winter moths, just a few. Um, most of them you're going to, if you're going to see them early, they've been pupating underground or in tree cracks over the winter. And so there's certainly seasonality to them. Um, I know that uh, the yellow-billed cuckoo times its migration uh, for when the uh, ten caterpillars are most numerous. And they're one of the few birds that seem to be able to, to, to eat any kind of moth caterpillar, no matter how poisonous, how hairy, how, no, anything. They, they just are really obligate to caterpillars, the, the, the um, yellow-billed cuckoos. Now, as far as there's, there's lots of seasonality. With global warming, there's a lot of concern that the synchronicity is getting out of whack where the insects are hatching before the birds get there. And so they miss this huge hash that they've always historically relied on. Um, so sometimes when I'm working with like Chuck Harp, um, I'll suggest an identification and he'll go, no, 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 you know, that only uh, is um, evident or, or present when such and such a plant is in bloom. And uh, you, so you won't see it this time of year, it's probably this one. So, and all of this, um, because there's so many thousands of species of moss and this information is in a lot of fascicles, which I find very expensive to buy and sometimes hard to read, not being a professional. The information is here, there's a lot of seasonality, the birds, rely on them, and we just hope that global warming doesn't screw up everything. Hope that more or less answered. I think so. Okay. Um, looks Hi, like everyone. 
Uh, this is Laverne Johnson of Lions, and I certainly enjoyed uh, the program. Um, I think I'm a member, but I'm not sure, but I've watched your programs. And I see where uh, Jan Chu is a member, and she's also a square dancer, as I am, and she flits around the country gathering up uh, moths and butterflies, mostly butterflies. So say yeah. hi to Jan Chu from uh, Redford. She's a dear friend and mentor. Okay, any other questions, Emil? Um, would you, do you have a field guide or an ID guide that would be useful to local, local seekers of moths? Um, the best is a website called uh, Moth Photographers Group. And it's, it's down the end of my program. And they um, have 12 or 13,000 different moths from all over the United States. And you can do all kinds of sorts by states or areas. There's also uh, butterflies and moths of North America, the bomonocyte, which will list uh, what moth species by county. So that's a really good place to go to too. Um, as iNaturalist has just exploded, I read the other day, they have almost 60 million postings there and they're working with uh, AI, the artificial intelligence, um, which is iffy for moss, but they're, um, the amount of, of moss that people are entering and correctly identified grows every month. And I'm finding, more and more able to use that to help uh, figure out, hey, you know, has anyone found this in Colorado and what could it possibly be? So again, these are all at the bottom of the um, presentation where I give the websites and uh, the books. Okay. All right, well, um... Oh, we'll end with this with this last question. What is your favorite moth? And then we'll we'll consider that the closing comments for tonight. Well, let me see. In Colorado, it would have to be uh, some of the 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 big hawk moths. They can just be so absolutely gorgeous. And in Thailand, the Zamorata, that incredibly pastel, lacy colored one, uh, melt my heart. Okay, well, we got a lot of great feedback. Um, so many people enjoyed your presentation this evening. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge. 